So in today's video, we'll be looking at classification. Now actually, I'll be talking about a couple of different topics from the textbook. So I'll be starting with the linear classification and talk about why we need it. Then I'll move on to binomial nomenclature and how do we actually write the names for different organisms and also why we actually need the system. And then finally, phylogeny. So first of all, I'm going to start with the linear classification. So on this planet, we have lots and lots of different organisms. So we can have, uh, obviously, us animals or humans or monkeys, chimpanzees, fish, giraffes, dolphins, all these sort of things. And we've got lots of different types of plants as well. And we also have mushrooms, planktons, bacteria, and all these things as well. But we need some way to actually put them into groups so we can better study them and maybe perhaps link them together to discover how life is formed in the first place. So that's why uh, this a classification system is developed by a Swedish botanist called Carl Linnaeus. Now here you can see that I put domain in brackets because he wasn't the one who sort of set this up, uh, but people later on decided that actually we can uh, even summarize all of them into three big domains. And these are Archaea, Bacteria, and Eukarya. And as the name implies, you know, no, eukarya refers to eukaryotes, the more developed organism, shall we say, with the nucleus. Eubacteria refers to uh, real bacteria, so unicellular organisms usually, and also without a nucleus. Archaea is an interesting one. It really only consists of one kingdom, which is Archaebacteria, and they are the ones that are ancient bacteria and often extremophiles as well. Then we can have a look at these different uh, bits here, and this is the actual classification system developed by uh, Linnaeus. So we have kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genies, and species. In the exams, you need to be able to put them in the correct order. So what might often happen is they give you a table, and then on one side will be this classification system in the correct order. And then they might also have a relevant name, shall we say, of a particular organism. So what's going to happen is perhaps they will blank out some parts of the classification a bit there. And then they just ask you to put the, write down the correct one in the correct space. You will not be asked to memorize any of the actual names of particular organisms. So just elaborate a little bit more. So additionally, we've got five kingdoms, but nowadays we actually say we have six kingdoms. So we have Archaebacteria and Eubacteria, Prototista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. So traditionally we have five kingdoms, which are these five here. Uh, but we call them Prokaryota, Prototista, and then Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. But nowadays we've got the sixth kingdom, which is Archaebacteria, because they want to make a distinction within Prokaryota into these two different types of bacteria in that sense. Archaebacteria are the ones that are ancient, so, and so they are there almost like since the beginning of time. And often they are extremophiles as well. And if you think about it, it's because perhaps in the beginning of time when Earth is just formed, the conditions are still quite harsh, so it could be really hot or really cold, very low oxygen levels, uh, etc. And so these bacteria that were able to survive in those situations are now what we call extremophiles, and we call them archaebacteria. Eubacteria, you, these are the bacteria that we get basically nowadays everywhere in our lives. Prototista, uh, which is interesting, they do have a nucleus, uh, but they are usually still unicellular as well, so quite simple organisms. Uh, they can also gain uh, nutrients uh, by doing photosynthesis if uh, for those of them with a chloroplast, uh, but some of them are actually looking at as a uh, parasite, so they can get nutrients from other organisms as well. So an example for Prototista would be, or we call them protists now, uh, would be the uh, Plasmodium, which is a uh, pathogen that causes malaria. As a fungi, an uh, obvious example will be mushrooms, these cellular organisms with a nucleus. And interestingly, a lot of them are prophytic, meaning they feed on decaying material. Then plantae and animalia, as the name you would probably guess, plantae referring to plants, and animalia referring to animals. You need to know a little bit more about the details of these different kingdoms. Uh, just be ready that they might give you a table, briefly describe what they might be. And actually the rest of this you don't really need to worry so much about, but you do need to know how to write the Latin name of organisms which is using these two bits here. Now like I said before, uh, they would ask you to memorize the correct order of this, so you need to find out some way to memorize it properly, so or in an easy way. One way that I would do it is I would say, King Philip comes over for great spaghetti, because why not? Uh, but I know there are several other ways to do it, uh, but obviously 
come up with the way that you feel most comfortable with and make sure you remember the correct names and the correct order. Then we'll quickly look at the reasons for uh, classifying organisms. So one of the reasons is that we can use this classification system to identify species uh, easily. We can look at some of the characteristics that they share and then think, okay, which bit do they uh, go into? And in the same principle, we can also predict characteristics that certain organisms may have. So it's almost working it the other way around from, uh, for identifying species. And finally, we can use these classifications to find evolutionary links. For example, we can look at two different organisms and let's say they belong to the same genus. We can perhaps then find out uh, how closely related they might be or indeed the same thing if they're in, another fam in the same family but different genus and species. Then again, there is another evolutionary link there. We can link that to phylogeny, which we'll talk about later on. Binomial nomenclature sounds really fancy, but really what it's saying is that we need a naming system for the different organisms. And the way they name things will be uh, using genus and species of the organisms to give them a name. Now you need to think about why do we need to uh, give them a Latin name, a binomial name, rather than just calling its own name. And that is one of the reasons that we will discuss. So well, let's say, for example, we've got humans, right? So we call ourselves humans, but sometimes we refer to ourselves as people as well. Um, so there are different ways of calling it. On top of that, if you are from a different country or you speak a different language, then again, you will be saying it slightly differently. So we need some way to make sure everyone who, let's say, everyone who does science will be able to identify the same species in the same way in the same language so that everybody can understand. So we need a, almost like a common language. And so that's why they uh, decided to use the binomial nomenclature there. On top of that, we can actually use their binomial names to have a look at their uh, relationships between organisms. Let's say we have two different organisms and we know of their uh, binomial names and we can have a look at it and see if they are of the same species or of the same genus. So you can have different organisms with the same genus name but different species name. So we know that they are somewhat related, but they're still two different species, which is quite useful when it comes to uh, predicting characteristics or looking for evolutionary links. Now on to actually how do we uh, write the, the names of them? So a few things to notice really, that number one, this is written in Latin. Obviously Latin is no longer a proper, in some sense, a proper used language, to, but uh, we still use it for scientific communication uh, because it is a uh, scientific language in some sense. If we have to write a name in Latin, uh, we can't write it as normally like that, so we have to show that it's different. If you're typing the binomial name, you need to make sure that you type in italics. But if you're writing it in an exam, uh, there's no way you can write uh, the name and then say that it is in italics by you know, slanting it a little bit. You have to make sure it's really clear. So that's why it's really important that you underline what that you're writing. We have to make sure that we start with genus, uh, but the first letter has to be capital. For example, I'm gonna word, write the word Homo sapiens, so I'm gonna write it with a capital H for my genus name, and then for my species name, I'm gonna write in small letters. Now, underline it to show that it is Latin. Just keep in mind that if you didn't put a capital letter, first letter for genus, you didn't put a small letter for this first letter of species, or you didn't underline it, you will lose that mark. Okay, and it's such an easy mark, and please make sure that you don't do that. 